Welcome back to the deep dive. Are you ready to have your mind blown? Mm -mm. Because today we are talking about something truly revolutionary. The psychobiotic revolution. That's right. We're going deep into the world of the gut microbiome. Yes. And exploring how those trillions of tiny organisms living inside us mm -hmm. are actually influencing our mood, our behavior, our overall health. They really are. It's like discovering we have a secret society living inside us, pulling the strings. Who can say that? Now, before we get too far down the rabbit hole. Okay. If you love deep dives into fascinating topics like mm -hmm. this one. Yes. Yeah. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on future episodes. Now, to get us started, I think it's mind-blowing that for so long, we thought our brains were calling all the shots. Right. Like the brain was the CEO. Exactly. The brain was in charge of our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors. Right. But now we're realizing that the gut. The gut. The gut is not just along for the ride. Yes. Yeah. It's practically co-piloting our lives. Wow, you're saying my gut has a brain of its own. Well, not exactly a brain, but it does have its own complex neural network. Oh, wow. It's called the enteric nervous system. Let's see that again. The enteric nervous system. Yeah. And it lines your entire digestive tract. Really? It can operate independently, making decisions about digestion. Okay. Gut motility without even checking in with the brain. So my gut is like making executive decisions down there. It kind of has its own intuition, but with a direct hotline to the brain. Oh, wow. And this is where it gets even more interesting. Okay. The second brain. This enteric nervous system. Yes, is home to trillions of microbes, your microbiota. Oh, we hear about this microbiota all the time. Yes, and they're constantly sending messages up to the brain. So it's not just about digestion, is it? No, not at all. These microbial messengers are influencing your mood. Really? Your behavior, even your immune system. It's like we're puppets and they're the puppet masters. Well, it's more of a collaborative relationship, but we're only beginning to understand the full scope of their influence. Wow. So let's back up a bit. Where does this microbiota even come from? Okay. Are we burned with it or is it something we acquire over time? That's a great question. Yeah. And for a long time, we thought babies were born sterile. Oh, really? Completely free of microbes. Interesting. But now we know that they inherit microbes even before taking their first breath. So even before they're born. There's evidence that suggests microbes might already be present in the womb. Oh, wow. Shaping the developing immune system before birth. So we're talking about microbial influence from day zero, literally. Yes, it seems that way. Wow. And then, of course, the journey continues during birth. Right. Babies born vaginally, yes. they get coated with their mother's vaginal microbes, exactly. while those born via C-section inherit microbes from the surrounding environment. That's right. So our first microbial neighbors are determined by how we enter the world. <laughs> That's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. But why is this early exposure to microbes so important? Well, think of your immune system as a rookie cop. Okay. I like this. Early exposure to a diverse range of microbes is like rigorous training. Training. Teaching it to distinguish the good guys, the beneficial bacteria, okay. from the bad guys, the pathogens. How about bad bacteria? Right. And this training is crucial mm -hmm. because it ensures that the immune system knows to tolerate the good bacteria okay. and effectively combats the harmful ones. So a healthy, diverse microbiota is like having a well-trained immune system. Exactly like having a strong police force patrolling your body. I like that analogy, keeping everything in check. And this microbial training is most critical in early life. Okay. Because if the microbiota isn't properly educated. What happens? You can end up with an overactive immune system. Okay. Triggering inflammation. Right. And this can set the stage for a whole host of health issues down the road. Including mental health issues, right? Including mental health issues, absolutely. So early microbial exposure really sets the stage for lifelong well-being. It really does. What happens next in this microbial journey? Well, breast milk plays a pivotal role. Breast milk. It's not just a source of nutrition for the baby, right? but it also contains beneficial bacteria and prebiotics. Prebiotics. These are like food for the good bacteria in the baby's gut. Wait, so mother's milk isn't just feeding the baby. Right. It's feeding the bacteria too. Exactly. It's like a two for one deal. Wow. Mother Nature is pretty clever. She is. And these prebiotics, particularly in breast milk, yeah. they promote the growth of beneficial bacteria. Like which ones? Like bifidobacteria. Bifidobacteria. Okay. Which are essential for a healthy gut. So we're designed to be teeming with these microbes from the very start. We are. What happens as we grow older? Well. Does our microbial community stay the same? 
Adolescence brings a whole new wave of changes. Oh no, teenagers. Hormones, lifestyle factors, social interactions. Yeah. They all influence the microbiota during this period. So just like teenagers are going through a lot of changes. Exactly. Our guts are too. It's like your gut is going through its own teenage rebellion. Always causing trouble, those teenagers, even on a microscopic level. And this is where things can get a little tricky. Okay. Because the increase in stress... Teenagers have a lot of stress. They do. Sleep deprivation. Yes. Maybe not the best food choices. Not always. These are all common during the teenage years, right? Right. And these can tip the microbial scales towards imbalance. Oh, no. We call this dysbiosis. Dysbiosis. Okay. So our gut bacteria are sensitive to all the ups and downs of adolescence. They are. And remember that direct line between the gut and brain? Yeah, the vagus nerve. Exactly. Yeah. Well, during the teenage years... When our brains are already undergoing massive rewiring. Oh, yeah. So much is happening. This communication becomes even more critical. I see. An imbalanced gut during this time yeah. can amplify mood swings. So those teenage mood swings mm -hmm. might be partly due to the gut. Possibly. And even increase the risk of mental health challenges later in life. Wow. This is all starting to make sense now. Good. Our gut isn't just passively digesting food, right. it's actively shaping our mood, yes. behavior, yes. even our long-term health. You got it. It's like realizing we have a superpower we never knew about. It is a superpower. Absolutely. We're only beginning to tap into its potential. Well, I'm definitely feeling empowered to take better care of my gut. Good. But before we get into the practical steps, sure. I'm really curious about this communication highway between the gut and brain. Okay. How do trillions of microbes actually send messages upstairs? Well, it's pretty amazing, yeah. the gut-brain axis. Mm -hmm. It's a complex network yeah. involving multiple pathways. Okay. But one of the key players is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve. Think of it as a high-speed fiber optic cable. Oh, wow. Transmitting messages between the gut and brain. So it's like a direct line between our gut feelings and our actual feelings. Exactly. And these messages go beyond just simple digestive updates. Oh, wow. They can influence mood, wow. behavior, even cognitive function. So it's like our gut bacteria are sending emails to our brain. Yes. Affecting how we think and feel. That's a good way to put it. I'm starting to feel a lot more respect for those tiny tenants down there. They're doing a lot for us. They are. They're producing all these signaling molecules, mm -hmm. including neurotransmitters oh, right. like serotonin and dopamine, Yes, which play a crucial role in mood regulation. Exactly. Hold on. Are you telling me that my gut bacteria yes. are producing the same chemicals that make me feel happy or sad? That's right. That's wild. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, <laughs> We also have the immune system and the endocrine system chiming in. Oh, my goodness. Making this gut-brain communication network incredibly complex. Okay. My mind is officially blown. I told you. We have this whole other world operating inside us. We do. Influencing our thoughts, our feelings, oh, that's so even our destinies. It really is. I think we need a moment to process all of this. Yes. Let's take a break and come back for part two. All right. We'll be back soon to delve into specific conditions impacted by this gut-brain connection. Looking forward to it. And explore what we can do to cultivate a thriving, happy microbiome. Sounds good. Don't go anywhere. See you soon. Welcome back. I hope you've had a chance to let all that information sink in. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that my gut bacteria are practically running the show. Well, get ready for more because we're about to dive even deeper. Deeper, okay. Remember that example we talked about earlier? Which one? The Walkerton water contamination. Oh, right. The E. coli outbreak in Canada. Exactly. A tragic event that really highlights the power of the gut-brain connection. Yeah, a lot of people got sick. Thousands of people experienced severe gastrointestinal illness. Right. But what's really striking is that months after the initial infection, mm -hmm. a significant portion of those affected developed IBS. IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Yes, and surprisingly... Depression. Depression, wow. This event was a wake-up call. How so? It showed us that infections can disrupt the gut microbiota, God, triggering inflammation that impacts mental well-being. So even a temporary infection can have a lasting impact. Exactly. The effects can linger long after the infection itself is gone. That's scary. Yeah. But what about chronic conditions? Okay. You mentioned that gut dysbiosis is linked to a bunch of different health issues. 
It, and let's take inflammatory bowel diseases or IBDs, for example. IBDs. Like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Right. These conditions involve chronic inflammation in the gut. Okay. And they're often accompanied by anxiety and depression. So the inflammation in the gut could be contributing to mental health issues. It's a possibility and vice versa. The mental health issues could worsen the inflammation. It's like a double whammy. Exactly. A vicious cycle. And research shows that people with IBDs often have an altered gut microbiome. They do. There's less diversity in different proportions of bacterial species. Compared to people without IBDs. Right. And this imbalance can fuel the chronic inflammation. It's like the gut bacteria are adding fuel to the fire. That's a good way to put it. But there's hope. There is. That's where the concept of psychobiotics comes in. Psychobiotics. We hear that term a lot these days. And for good reason. Think of them as beneficial bacteria. Okay, the good guys. Yes, with a special talent for boosting mood and mental well-being. So psychobiotics are like probiotics. Sort of. But specifically for mental health. Exactly. They interact with the gut-brain axis. That highway between the gut and brain. Yes, modulating neurotransmitter production, okay. reducing inflammation, uh -huh. influencing the immune system. So you're saying we might be able to treat mental health conditions. It's a possibility. Just by introducing these good bacteria into our gut. Research is ongoing. That's incredible. Rick. Can you give us some examples of how these psychobiotics are being used? Sure. One exciting area is using psychobiotics to treat IBS. IBS, which we know is often linked to anxiety and depression. Right. Certain strains of bacteria have shown promise in alleviating both the physical and mental symptoms. So these psychobiotics are like multitaskers. They are. Tackling gut problems and mood problems at the same time. Two birds with one stone. Exactly. For example, you mentioned lactobacillus plantarum. Yes, lactobacillus plantarum. Which is found in fermented foods like sauerkraut. Right. It's been shown to reduce abdominal pain, right. bloating, and even improve mood in people with IBS. So a daily dose of sauerkraut could be the key to a happier gut. And a happier mind. I'm liking the sound of this. What other promising psychobiotics are out there? Well, there's bifidobacterium longum. Bifidobacterium longum. Studies well. have shown that it can modulate the stress response. Really? And reduce anxiety in humans. It's like having an army of microscopic stress busters. Working hard to keep you calm. I like it. But are psychobiotics only effective for common mental health conditions? Like anxiety and depression. Yeah. Or can they help with more complex issues? Researchers are exploring their potential for a range of conditions. Like what? Including autism spectrum disorder. Autism, wow. Studies suggest that children with ASD okay. often have an altered gut microbiome. So there's a possible connection between gut bacteria and autism. The research is still ongoing, but it's an intriguing area. Yeah, definitely. But let's talk practicalities. Okay. How do we actually get these mood-boosting microbes into our system? That's the million-dollar question. Is it as simple as popping a probiotic? Probiotic supplements can be helpful, okay. but it's crucial to choose wisely. What do you mean? Not all probiotics are created equal. I see. Their effectiveness depends on the specific strains used, okay. the dosage, and even the manufacturing process. So choosing a probiotic is a little more complicated than I thought. It can be. There's a lot of marketing hype out there. So how do we navigate the probiotic aisle? Look for probiotics that contain strains that have been scientifically studied. Okay, for their psychobiotic effects. Exactly. You want evidence, not just promises. Got it. No impulse buys in the probiotic aisle. Mm. What else should we look for on the label? Well, first, check for specific strain designations. Strain designations. Instead of just seeing lactobacillus acidophilus, okay. look for lactobacillus acidophilus and CFM. NCFM. Okay, so it's like choosing a specific wine vintage. Exactly. You want to know the specific qualities of what you're getting. Makes sense. Also, you mentioned CFUs. Colony forming units. Right. What are those again? CFUs indicate the number of live bacteria in the supplement. So more CFUs are better, right? Not necessarily. Well, really? A probiotic with fewer CFUs of well-studied strains okay. might be more effective than one with more CFUs of less studied strains. So quality over quantity. Precisely. Okay, so we need to be discerning shoppers when it comes to probiotics. We do, but probiotics are just one piece of the puzzle. What else can we do to cultivate a thriving, happy microbiome? Diet is arguably the most powerful tool. Okay, let's talk food then. Fiber is essential. Fiber, okay. It's the favorite food of our beneficial bacteria. 
So fruits, vegetables, Kids. whole grains, legumes. All of those act as prebiotics. Prebiotics, which feed the good bacteria. Exactly. It's back to basics. Eating our fruits and veggies. Like our mothers always told us. What about fermented foods? Ah, oh, fermented foods. Hey, everyone's talking about them. And for good reason. Yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi. Okay. These are all naturally rich in probiotics. So they deliver a dose of beneficial bacteria straight to our gut. Like a spa day for your microbiome. And research suggests that fermented foods may have psychobiotic effects. That's right. They could be influencing our mood and behavior. I'm all for eating my way to happiness. What about exercise? Exercise is crucial. For our gut health. Yes. It increases gut diversity. Okay. Promotes the growth of beneficial bacteria. Wow. And even reduces inflammation in the gut. So those endorphins we get from exercise. Yes. They're not just good for our brain. Right. They're good for our gut too. Everyone benefits. But what about stress? Oh, stress is a big one. It is Chronic stress can wreak havoc on the gut microbiome. How so? When we're stressed, our bodies release hormones like cortisol. Cortisol, the stress hormone. Right, and this disrupts the bacterial balance in the gut. Oh no. Which can then exacerbate mental health issues. So managing stress is important not just for our mental health, uh, but for our gut health as well. It's all connected. Makes sense. Uh. What about people who think their gut might be out of whack? Out of balance. Yeah, what are some signs of dysbiosis? Well, it's always best to consult a healthcare professional. Of course. But there are some common signs that suggest an imbalance. Like what? Digestive issues are a big one. Digestive issues, okay. Frequent bloating, right. gas, uh -huh. constipation, diarrhea, right. abdominal pain. These can all be indicators of gut dysbiosis. So if our gut is sending us distress signals. Oh, we should listen. We need to pay attention. Absolutely. And it's not just digestive symptoms, right? Right. Skin issues. Skin issues? Yeah. Like what? Like eczema or acne. Oh, wow. Food sensitivities. Okay. Even yeah. mood changes. Mood changes. Increased anxiety, low mood. These can all be linked to gut dysbiosis. So our gut is trying to tell us something? It is. We just need to learn how to listen. That's like a whole new language we need to learn. It's exactly. How. The language of the gut. This has been so eye-opening. Glad to hear it. I'm looking at food and exercise and stress management in a whole new light now. That's the goal. Knowing how much they impact those trillions of tiny organisms living inside me. Your microbial allies? They're more than allies. They're practically running the show. And we're just beginning to understand their influence. That's what's so exciting. There's so much more to discover. Well, I can't wait to see what the future holds for this whole psychobiotic revolution. Me too. It's an exciting time for science. It is. And to our listeners, yes. thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the gut microbiome. We appreciate you being here. We'll be back soon for part three. Yes, we'll be back. Where we'll explore even more mind-blowing connections between the gut microbiome and specific health conditions. From obesity to Parkinson's disease. Don't miss it. Welcome back to the deep dive. Ready for the final leg of our journey into the gut microbiome. We're going even deeper, exploring the gut's connection to conditions you might not expect. I'm fascinated to hear more. We talked about IBDs, but you mentioned celiac disease too. What's the link between gluten sensitivity and the gut microbiome? Well, celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder, right? Right. Triggered by gluten. Exactly. And for people with celiac disease eating gluten, it triggers an immune response that mm. damages the small intestine. And this leads to problems absorbing nutrients. So gluten is like public enemy number one for their digestive system. Pretty much, yeah. But where does the gut microbiome fit into all of this? Well, research is showing that people with celiac disease often have a different gut microbiome. Different how? They tend to have less diversity in their gut bacteria and different proportions of certain species compared to people who don't have celiac disease. So even though gluten is the trigger... You're saying the gut microbiome could be playing a role in how severe the reaction is. That's what the research suggests, yeah. Some studies even suggest that certain bacteria might be more prevalent in those with celiac disease, yeah, sure. potentially contributing to the inflammation and damage. It's amazing how these tiny organisms can have such a big impact. It is, isn't it? Speaking of complex relationships, what about eating disorders? How does gut dysbiosis play a role there? Well, eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia, they oh, yeah. involve these really distorted eating patterns, right? Yeah, and often lead to malnutrition. Exactly. And that severe malnutrition, it has a huge impact on the gut microbiome. So it's not just the psychological aspect of the eating disorder, but the physical stress on the gut 
is contributing to the problem as well. Absolutely. When someone restricts their food intake like that, they're essentially starving their gut bacteria too. And that makes sense. This leads to a decline in those beneficial bacteria, okay. creating a state of dysbiosis. And then that dysbiosis further exacerbates the eating disorder. It's like a vicious cycle. The eating disorder messes up the gut, and then the messed up gut makes the eating disorder worse. Exactly. You get it. The altered gut microbiome can then start messing with hormone production. Oh, wow. Which leads to even more disturbances in eating behavior. It's a domino effect. It is. And then on top of that, you have the gut inflammation, well, which I... impacts nutrient absorption right. and just overall health. So it's a really complex problem. Yeah. But is there anything we can do to break free from this cycle and restore a healthy gut microbiome? Well, first and foremost, you have to address the underlying psychological issues that are driving the eating disorder. Right, of course. But in terms of the gut, working with a registered dietitian oh, to create a balanced and nutritious eating plan that supports gut health, that's essential. So it's a holistic approach. It has to be. Nourishing both the mind and the gut. Exactly. Now, what about obesity? We see that a lot these days. It's a global health challenge. It is. Does the gut microbiome have a role to play in that too? Obesity is complex. There's no doubt about that. Right. Lots of factors involved. Genetics, lifestyle, environment, they all contribute. Mm -hmm. But research is showing that the gut microbiome is likely a significant contributor as well. So you're saying our gut bacteria might be nudging us toward weight gain? Well, it's not quite that simple, okay. but studies have shown that people with obesity tend to have a different gut microbiome compared to lean individuals. Different how? Less bacterial diversity is one thing. Okay. And certain types of bacteria might be more abundant. So how do these gut bacteria contribute to weight gain? Well, some research suggests that certain gut bacteria are just more efficient at extracting energy from food. So they're like super efficient calorie miners. Exactly. They're helping us squeeze every last calorie out of our food. And those extra calories over time. Can lead to weight gain. That's incredible. So could we manipulate the gut microbiome to manage obesity? That's the big question, right? It's like we're talking about microbial landscaping. I like that. Cultivating a gut garden that favors a healthy weight. Exactly. We're a long way from a microbiome-based solution for obesity, but it's definitely an area of active research. It's remarkable how interconnected everything is. We've mm -hmm. covered so much ground here from IBDs and celiac disease to eating disorders and obesity, but we can't wrap up this deep dive without talking about neurological disorders. Like Parkinson's. Yes, Parkinson's disease. Is there a link between the gut microbiome and conditions like that? There could be. Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disorder. Right. It affects movement. Tremors, stiffness, difficulty with balance and coordination. Right. This is a tough one. It is. And emerging research suggests that the gut microbiome might actually be involved in its development and progression. So even brain health could be influenced by our gut bacteria. That's what the research is suggesting. Wow. So what have they found? Full studies show that individuals with Parkinson's often have an altered gut microbiome compared to healthy people. So there are differences. And this has led researchers to investigate whether gut dysbiosis might actually contribute to the onset of the disease. That's incredible. If that's true, it opens up a whole new avenue for potentially preventing or treating Parkinson's. Could we manipulate the gut microbiome to protect the brain? It's still early days, but researchers are looking into things like probiotics, okay. prebiotics, even fecal microbiota transplantation Transplant. for Parkinson's. It's being explored as a potential therapy. Wow. The hope is that by restoring a healthy gut microbiome, we might be able to slow or even prevent the progression of the disease. This entire deep dive has been mind-blowing. It's like we've uncovered this hidden universe inside us. We have. Influencing our health and well-being in ways we never imagined. And we're only just scratching the surface. I know. Thank you so much for being our guide on this incredible journey. You've shared so much groundbreaking information. I feel like I have a whole new understanding of just how powerful my gut really is. It's a powerful force, that's for sure. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the psychobiotic revolution. We hope it's inspired you to take a closer look at your own gut health. Remember, every day is a chance to nourish your second brain and cultivate a thriving inner ecosystem. And if you enjoyed this deep dive, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more explorations into cutting edge topics that will expand your mind and empower you to live a healthier, happier life. We'll see you next time. Until then, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep feeding your second brain.